Welcome back to our circle of healing and recovery. The elders say it's important for us to practice silence. They say, whenever we get together as a group or as an individual, we should start by being still. I want you to take the next two minutes to get quiet and say a prayer to our Creator and ask Him to put words and thoughts in your mind which will help you focus. In this segment, we want to take a look at the developmental stages of a human being. Just like you'd have developmental stages of a flower, you'd have the seed, then the roots, then the stem, then the leaves, then the bulb, then the flower. Those would be how a flower develops. So if you could imagine this little human being riding on the earth, the earth is spinning around in a circle, it's tilting back and forth, and it's also orbiting in a big universe that it seems that the way the Creator made things that grow, He made them to go through stages, through developing, developing stages. So as we look at how the human being develops, the human de being develops in four stages, in a circle, baby, youth, adult, and elder, then baby again. That's where the human being develops. But as the human being develops from baby, youth, to adult, elder, there are eight feelings that a human being needs to experience as it grows up in order for it to function functionally. And if the human being does not experience these eight feelings, the odds are quite good then the human being will function dysfunctionally. So it's very difficult if we are in a recovery program where we have habits of functioning dysfunctionally and to figure out how to function functionally without getting these eight feelings. Or how is it, if we are in relationships, say, or work relationships or personal relationships, is it possible for the human being to function functionally and dysfunction? Because that's another good point of view. Because as we grow, we have a tendency to say, well, everybody's got to do it. Or if they do it, then I can do it. But suppose they don't do it and you want to grow. Then are you able to do something to yourself to function functionally? I think Gandhi said it best one time. Gandhi said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. It's about you changing you. And each of us needs to change ourselves. But of course, if you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know about these feelings, then your best effort will maybe get you uh, headed in wrong directions, or maybe you could make a change in a year, and if you didn't know about it, it'd take you two years, three years, ten years. Maybe some people would never change. So what we want to do is we want to talk about these feelings that, that goes around the development of the human being. There are certain feelings that we need to have. Now, as I talk about this, some of you are going to laugh. Some of it's you can say, oh, gosh, that's me, or, oh, I know so-and-so did that. And some of you hit yourself in the head and go, oh, no, I've been that way forever. I didn't know that. So some of you are going to be moving as we talk in this presentation. You're going to be moving from, I don't know what I don't know, to now I know what I don't know. That movement, by the way, is called an aha. That's when you hit yourself in the forehead. So we want to talk about these eight developmental stages that the human being needs to experience. Because if you don't have the feeling, the odds are pretty good you're locked into dysfunction. It's very hard to correct it. So it seems the first feeling, I'm going to work some here from this uh, circle on this flip chart here. Now it seems that the first feeling that the baby needs to have, and this happens actually inside of the womb, that baby is picking up on all the cells and all the thoughts of the mom and dad and its family. So that baby's experiencing certain things. But the very first feeling that the baby must have is a sense of trust. Now this might happen from prior to birth to maybe, oh, maybe 18 months or so. And what this means, a sense of feeling, this feeling of trust, what it means is that the baby needs, it's, just, it's a sense, it's a feeling like the world is a good place, and man, I belong in it. That's trust. See? The world is a good place. This relationship is a good relationship, and man, I belong in it. This family is a good family, and I'm wanted in it. And it's just the feeling that you get. So every human being needs to have developed, in order for it to grow mentally healthy, is this sense of trust. Now, it seems that some years ago, they found out, uh, I think it was in Germany, uh, they were, they were watching babies that were put in orphanages. And what they found out is most all babies died 
within the first year of being put in an orphanage. They fed them, they, were, they cleaned them, but they would just die. They couldn't figure out how come. The babies would just die. But they heard in Germany there was this orphanage over there where the babies were not dying. So they sent a little research team over there. And what they got there, and uh, they did their analysis on this orphanage, they found there's this German woman. I think they, in the documentation, that her name was Anna or something like that. But anyway, what she did is, uh, as she worked in the orphanage, she had built a system of, like, little diaper pouches. So she'd build a pouch, and she'd have a kid in that pouch, and she'd have one on her other hip, and she'd have a kid in that pouch, and she had somehow uh, this harness, so she had a kid on her back. So she'd go about her day cleaning and cooking, and she's, these kids are slapping on her body like this and touching her. And it was there that, that the initials, that TLC, Tender Loving Care, it came from that study. They found out that just those babies, because they were being touched, because they were hanging on to a human being, that these babies, they, they were living and they were not dying. That's how essential touch is. And that's how essential, because touch develops this sense of trust. So it says for the human being to grow mentally healthy, one of the things I have to have is a sense of trust. That would allow me to function functionally, or allow me to function in harmony with the principal laws and values of creation. But supposing that I didn't develop a sense of trust, then I'm going to have a sense of mistrust. So if I grow up and I have a sense of mistrust, or I don't get the sense of trust, then you will see behavior problems later on. You'll see problems in relationships. You'll see difficult and uh, risk-taking. You'll see wall builders. You'll see people say, you know, you're a wall builder. I am not. Yes, you are. I've known you. I've been with you for eight years. You know something? I don't really know who you are sometimes. I don't know. See, and you'll be communicating with people, and you, you'll have a very difficult time telling them anything about yourself. You'll always, so they'll ask you a question, well, what do you think? Uh, I can't think right now. What do you think? See, So you'll divert the question back out. How come? Because you don't have a sense of trust. So as we come into the recovery program, then you'll see in the steps what it does is it helps us to come back and get that sense of trust. Because what happens if I go from mistrust in relationships to a trust in relationships? That I develop within myself that ability to trust. Then all of a sudden I can connect. See, sometimes they say, you, they say this sometimes about Indian men, I know. They say, like, they don't trust, they don't talk, they don't feel. You get accused of not being able to feel. And why is that? You have a sense of mistrust. So, like, when I was raised, I come around this cycle of life, I wasn't raised necessarily in a trusting relation, household. There was my father was a very serious alcoholic, and there was a lot of shouting and screaming, and there were many, many things that went on there, very, very young. So I didn't develop a sense of trust. So that's one of the things when we go through this 12 steps we, that you've got to have in your awareness or you look at it in steps one is when you start to see mistrust, be honest about it. That you've got to be able to admit that, that sometimes how I react in relationships or in jobs is I'm not trusting. See, and people pick up on that because we live in an interconnected system. Now let's just say you get a baby, though, gets past this 18 months. And it comes to this next stage of development, which sometimes is called autonomy or a sense of independence. And this is a feeling. This might happen for maybe 18 months to maybe three years old. Now, it is here where the baby starts to walk around. So in other words, let's just say that this baby develops trust. And the baby thinks the world is a good place and man, I belong in it. And all of a sudden, it gets a set of legs and it learns to walk. Now, as this baby goes around the world, I mean, it, it takes an adult, three adults full time just to keep up with them because they're just into everything. And they're just, uh, they're, they're, they're experimenting and grabbing and touching and breaking and bending, and uh, you, you just can't keep up with them. And have you ever noticed what's the two most favorite words of a two-year-old? No. Uh-uh. Now, why is it that they act this way? They're actually very mentally healthy when they go, no, uh-uh. Because this is where they get this feeling of independence they now need to break away from mom and dad. In other words, they got to say, I'm independent, because what they're developing here is the ability for later on to be really good at choices and decisions. That's what they're doing. That's what I do it myself. And they just drive you crazy. I mean, you'll want to butter their bread. If you took a look at the size of her bread and a butter knife to a two-year-old, if it was an adult, I mean, that bread is this big, the knife is this long, the bowl is that big, 
and they dip that knife in there and they're trying to butter that bread and you're trying to do it for them. No, I'll do it. I'll do it myself. And they're just rebellious. It just, they just drive you crazy. In fact, a two-year-old would be a perfect teenager if they could just drive a car. Think about it. They'd just be perfect, but they can't drive. And they just drive you crazy. Let's just say that you have uh, maybe two sisters have two boys, and they bring them over to Grandma's place for a Sunday dinner. One brings her little boy in. She sets it on the counter or whatever chair, and that baby just sits there, and it's also perfect with a little tie, a little suit and everything on. It's really cool. And the other sister brings in, and she's got this little hellion, and his legs are going like this. And when she sets him down, he's on the floor, into the kitchen, drags out the pots and pans. You clean up the pots and pans in there, into the flour, and they're tasting the dirt, and they grab the cat, put the cat in the dryer, hit the button, try to spin the cat. You just can't keep up with him. You put him in a high chair, give him some milk, they grab the toast, they dump it in the milk, and they're squeezing it and making a mess. And you say, why the hell can't you be like that good little boy? It may be very well that good little boy later on will have mental health problems. And that little hellion that's out there making decisions, doing the choices. You see now, it is here most of us when we grow up, it starts about two years old, where you start to watch how adults treat children. So the child does something innocently. Bad boy, shame on you, bad girl. So we start to put shame and guilt in at a very, very young age when Really, this child is just doing what they're supposed to do. So if you, if you uh, are not encouraged, see, like, it's like when we have these two-year-olds, we got to, we got to know that's is what they're going through. So we need to encourage choices and decisions. So when you see them do something, even though it's not right, they're buttering that bread and it's all messed up. You go, ooh, I like how you buttered that bread. You go, you ever see them? Nose goes up, and they go on to see what the next trouble they're going to get in. And I'm not talking about safety. I'm talking you got to discipline for safety. What I'm talking about in these things, you've got to know what they're developing is a feeling of independence. They've got to make choices and decisions, and they practice it very, very young. But what happens if you grow up in an environment where you don't make choices and decisions, where you can't do that? Later on, you'll see people will be wishy-washy, right? So they'll come up and they'll, uh, somebody say, uh, why don't you go for that job? I think you'd be good at uh, I don't think they like me. Uh, I, I don't know if I could do that. Well, what do you think? So you go to this person, they say, oh, I think you could do it. So I'm going to do it. You go to the next person, you ask him, what do you think? They say, oh, I think you do terrible. Oh, I better not. See, so-and-so says. So you'll see indecision. They can't make decisions later on as you grow up. So part of what we need to do in the steps that we come back to is as we get rid of that guilt and that shame, much of that stuff that comes in there, you start to cease to, get to be decisive. You start to see, I can make choices. I can make decisions. But if you do not get that feeling of independence within yourself, as you get through the steps or any kind of growing process you do, you'll have a very difficult time with decisions, with choices. How come? Because we didn't have that feeling of independence. Then you'll see that kid will come out of that two-year-old stage as it grows up on the earth that's spinning around, tilting back and forth, and the seasons are going on. It'll enter this next stage, and this is, happens maybe four to seven, this stage of initiative. And it is here where the child now is going to develop its creativity. Now, if you ever notice, they'll go from just being this little hellion, and all of a sudden they're like a fraidy cat. They're scared. You take them in bed, you put them in bed at night, and they'll see like a movement of a shadow of a branch on the window shade or something. Zip, they come right into your room. Mom, there's a monster in there. There's a ghost in there. Oh, I'm just scared. And you'll take them in and say, oh, no, and you raise up the shade. It was just a branch. It was just a shadow. Oh, Okay. I'll stay here. And then uh, they, 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 they're just pretending. And uh, like you'll be walking back to your bedroom, all of a sudden you'll feel them. They'll clamp their, they'll clamp their arms around your legs because they want to come sleep with you because they're afraid to stay in there. And they, they're just like they're afraid. And you see them pretending a lot. Like one day they're pretending they're a fireman, and the next day they're a cowboy, and the next day they're an Indian, and the next day they're a... In other words, they're wondering, I wonder what it's like to be a cowboy. So they pretend to be one. And the next day, I wonder what it's like to be a fireman. So they pretend to be one. Because they are now developing their imagination, the ability to imagine, to create, for vision. Now, very often when we see them do that, we start to get disciplined. We start to say, that's stupid. There is no such thing. So it's at that stage, 
and you'll watch them. Like uh, someday you'll be in the kitchen, and they'll come along. They'll be pretending to be a dog. You ever watch them? They'll pretend to be a dog. A lot of them do. And what they do, they'll come up there, and they bark, and they bark, and they'll sit up like this. They go, whoop, whoop, whoop. And you get up, you get a cookie. See, and you feed them the cookie. Speak. They go, whoop, speak, whoop, speak, whoop. And they give them the cookie, pat them on the head, see, kick them in the rear, and off they crawl into the living room, pretending to be a dog. Now, that's the way it's supposed to be, be when you're, see, four, five, six, and seven. If you have a teenager that's on her knees, barking like a dog, you have a sick kid, you are really, really, really in trouble. This has to happen, you see, much earlier. But then that child will go through that stage. See, so mentally healthy as we grow up, we need to have a sense of trust, we need to have this sense of independence, and we need to develop this initiative for creativity so you can think, so you can be creative, all part of the decision process. Then you get to this stage here from maybe seven to, uh, well, maybe 12. And this is an area of the, some call industry, or it's a sense of accomplishment. Now, this is a feeling that the human being needs to have during this part of the development. If you didn't get it, you got to go back and get it. And what this feeling is, it's a sense that I'm good at something. It's a feeling. You ever notice like when you're good at something, there's this feeling, you, I'm good at it? So you need to develop this feeling, I'm good at something or I'm good for something, in this feeling. Now you'll see like uh, in that parent, sometimes you'll see them, they, like boys clubs and girls clubs, you know, and they go to these little deals and they get a ribbon and they get a badge and they stand them up in front and they go, oh, by the work that you did, you get this little badge. You go, ooh, see, I'm good at it. It's a feeling that I'm good at something. So it is here, you see sports and different activities. So we need to know during that cycle of life, the human being, as it develops, it needs to have this feeling, damn, I'm good at something. I'm good for something, and it's a feeling. Because what happens if you don't get that feeling, I'm good at something, or I'm good for something? If you don't get that one, you're going to get the other. I'm good for nothing. I'm not good at anything kind of a feeling. So if you get that feeling that you're not good at anything, or you're not good for something, then you will see a type of behavior is recognizable later on. And you will see other people will see you different than they see you. They might look at you and say, whoa, you're just really good looking or you're really talented. Oh, if they only knew, not me. I, I couldn't do that. So you see a hard time taking risk. You see them a hard time trying to develop something. And, and even inside, you'll have two voices. One of them, you say, I know I could do that. And that other little voice says, I don't think so. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. I, I, I couldn't do it. So you'll have low feelings of worth. So later on, what will happen? You see yourself in a relationship. So you might have a relationship with somebody who might be really good for you or you know, somebody that you might perceive to be better than you. And maybe they'll really, really be interested in you. And they'll maybe make that move, you see, to come. On, and you hear yourself talk yourself right out. Ah, oh, as soon as they find out what I'm like, they won't have anything to do with me. So you'll see later on low feelings of worth. You will see like... Uh, Oh, oh gosh, just low feelings of self. You feel like down, like depression. So you see that type of behavior. So one of the things is as we grow and we work through these steps, sooner or later, and it usually happens when you get to step six or seven, you need to start telling yourself you're good at it. I'm not talking from the ego's point of view. And we'll cover that in step six, six or seven because you've got to create that feeling, I'm good at something, I'm good for something, feeling, in order to... Release your potential in order to, for you to uh, go on to, to be creative. Then once you get through the 7 to 12, you come to this age of maybe 12 uh, to say to maybe 20, the teenage years. And it is here now where the human being needs to develop this feeling of belonging. It's a sense of identity. In the development of the human being is the first time the human being will seek the answer to three questions. One is, why am I? What is my purpose? One is who am I? What is my identity? And one is where am I going? I need some direction. And you'll notice kids that get like 12 years old or something, you tell them to take out the garbage and say, all right, I will. And it happens about 30 days. All of a sudden you tell them to take out the garbage and they say, why don't you take a turn at it? What? This is my house. I paid a rent. As long as you live in here, you do what I say. Who the hell do you think you are to... see? But what they're doing now is they're breaking away again, once more. In other words, they don't want to be known anymore as Paul, the son of so-and-so. They want to be doing, I'm Paul. That's who I am. So you'll see these kids, they'll go through a crazy things. They drive adults nuts, two stages, one at twos and one in the teenage years. 
And you'll see them, they're trying to get this feeling of belonging. So they form like little cliques, right? You see them in schools. They got different names for them. I can't keep up with them all. Geeks and preps and whatever it is. But they have like little groups that they belong to. How come? Because there's little groups that they identify with that gives them that feeling of identity. Or you see them come to the parents. They always try to mess with parents. See, they say, what kind of music do you like? Oh, I like country and western. Oh, that old stuff from the 50s? You've got to be kidding. I like rap. See, I'm in. And you see, they'll have to dress a certain way. You see marketing people. Marketing people know this. And they, they like this kid, where they'll come up and they say, Mom, I have to get this tennis shoe. I thought I just bought you tennis shoes. Oh, no, Mom, not that. Those, I could be caught dead in those shoes. It has to be this one. It's got to have this emblem on. I'll die if I don't have it, Mom. Everybody has tennis shoes like this. And they cost $150. And you buy them the tennis shoes, and in 30 days, the white ones don't work. Now they're going to be green or purple or black. And, and they're piercing this, and they're changing this, and coloring their hair. And Jesus, drive you crazy because you can't keep up with them. Why? You say, why are they doing that? Well, they're trying to find that identity, that feeling of belonging. And every human being has it. Now, that feeling of belonging, it is so strong in the human being to get that if you cannot get this feeling of being good at being good at something, you can get that feeling from being good at being bad at something. And that's why gangs work. You see, if the parents don't care, you're too busy, too many jobs, whatever, that you don't do it, and you don't get that feeling of identity, gangs are waiting right there saying, we will give you that feeling of belonging. We will give you a title. We'll give you a certain initiation that you need to go through to get it. When you're in with us, you're in forever. You can belong here. It is so strong that they will do that. And you say, why would they do such a dumb thing? It's not dumb. They have to do it to maintain sanity. They're after this darn feeling. And all of us need to get that. You see, as we, as say as we grow up, we do not get this feeling. Then later on, like even in the 30s, late 30s, 40s, you see people getting an identity crisis. You ever hear of it? Identity crisis. So you see men, often, men will get like late 30s, 40s, and all of a sudden they get this identity crisis. And you'll see them, often they'll dump their wife of many years, and you'll, you'll see them go try to get a young one. And you'll see them, they'll go and they'll decorate their car, and they get little dogs whose uh, heads bounce in a car, and they change their muffler systems, and they, they start to dress like in wrap clothes, and they go hop up on a table, you know, they... Oh, the kid is here. The party can begin. you got this 40-year-old rapper, you know, trying, you see, to pretend that they're younger. And you see them, they have, like, depression. And you see them get, feel, like, sense of being lost. A lot of times, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of just uh, a terrible time. How come? Because they don't have this sense, you see, of identity. So later on, you'll see a behavior problem will occur. Then once you get to this 20s, and you get this feeling of belonging, as you approach the adult, the next you come to this, this uh, feeling of intimacy, intimacy. And this happens maybe from uh, oh, 20 to the 30s. And then now it is here where the, fee the human being needs to grow in this next feeling, in this that sense of, of sharing how I feel. It's not about whether you agree with me or not. See, it's preparing me for relationships, to be effective in relationships, that I can now tell you how I feel. You see college kids. They come home and maybe after a month or so at the university, they come home and I'm telling you, they have opinions about everything. Government's messed up, court is this, this is broke, mom is this, dad is this. They just got opinions about it. I don't care what it is, they got opinions about it. You see a couple of them talking. Like one is talking to the other and the other one's listening. Is the other one listening? No. As this one's talking, this one is thinking the up one'sman's story. Oh, you think your dad was so bad? You see, <coughs> I'll tell you how bad my dad is. So there's nobody listening. But every day, just talk, 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 talk. Five, six of them. That's all they do is talk. But you see, it is now that I have to have this feeling of intimacy. Now, if I just take a look at my life quickly. As I was raised in a dysfunctional family, I didn't know that. You know, you don't know what you don't know. So we didn't go around saying I'm dysfunctional. We thought that's just the way the stuff is. So my dad was a pretty, he was a pretty mean drunk. Uh, he uh, could, uh, he'd whip us like with uh, willow switches. But he'd tell you, I want you to go pick the switch that you're going to get whipped with. So we'd have to go choose the stick that we got to get whipped with. And when he'd whip us, he'd not only whip us till we cried, he would whip us till we quit crying. Even if a little kid, if you went, <sighs> if you just did one of that, that wasn't, you would, the, continue, the beatings would continue. 
And we'd be thrown out in the snow and locked in the door and watch what happened to our mom. And uh, there was all sorts of violent things that went on, you see, as we grew up. So pretty soon, like, he, you ever have this happen? Like, they'd line up and you'd say, you line everybody up. You say, I'm going to ask you one time, why did you do that? And you really didn't. You say, Dad, I didn't do it. Smackle right across the hall. So you'd go. So pretty soon you learn, don't say anything. Clam up. Stuff it. Even if you tell the truth, it doesn't work. So instead, as we were growing up, instead of getting these feelings of trust and independence, we had learned he ruled with an iron thumb. So we didn't do it. I remember when I was uh, like my late teenagers, there's one thing. I didn't see this until I got into steps. But you know one thing I wanted my dad to tell me one time? Two things. One, I wanted him to tell me I was good at something, and he never did. No matter what I did, it was never good enough. So I grew up then with this feeling it was never good enough. I was never good enough. It didn't matter whether it was the relationships or jobs. I was critical of myself, my self-talk, putting myself down. You're not going to make it. What's the matter with you? E even if it was really good, I would find something wrong with it. Or then, not only I find something wrong with it, I was always finding something wrong with everyone else too, because then you were not good enough. How come? Because I was not good enough. When I got in uh, ages of 9, 10, or 10 to like 11 and a half, I was being sexually molested by an uncle almost weekly. He'd come over to the house and he'd uh, uh, get me to go out and help plant crops and do certain work in the woods. And see, my mom would say, well, he wants you to come out there and help him. I say, Mom, I'm sick. You little lazy thing, you get out there and you go to work. But see, he had set it up so I couldn't tell anybody. So instead of getting these feelings, I'm good at something, I'm good for something, I was being molested. Does that make sense? I wasn't getting those feelings. Then I got into my adult years. I really struggled in relationships. Not just here, but later on I struggled in relationships. I could get them, but I couldn't keep them. And they would tell me, they say, you're a wall builder. And they would tell me all these things about myself. I said, no, I'm not. But I knew I was. In other words, I would put this front out, but inside I was really insecure. And I didn't know that I was insecure. I wouldn't let you know it anyway. So I had a hard time letting you see anybody in. So this is the way that the human being has to develop. And so as we go back through these steps, these are the things that the step starts to give us. We start to, we start to get these feelings back using the process of the steps. Now, do you think that I could be intimate if I didn't know who I am? Uh-uh. See, you've got to know who I am before I can be intimate. Do you think that I can be intimate if I don't have a sense of trust? No. No matter how many books I read, what I do in order for me to trust, to, have a, to be intimate, that connectedness, that feeling, I need to have these feelings. So we've got to come back and get them in this order, too, by the way. You've got to develop trust. Then once you get to trust, you get the next feeling, the next feeling. And they start to come around, you start to get clear. Now, once we get through the stage of intimacy, we enter the stage of generativity. This happens probably 30 to maybe 40 or so. By the way, these stages of development are not age dependent, they're maturity dependent. It's how you mature, it's a maturing issue, an emotional. Like you can have an immature 40 year old. You ever see him? Yeah. But you can have a seven, you can have a, a mature seven year old. You can have a mature teenager. In fact, sometimes you see some teenagers are more mature than their parents. So it's about growing up. It's about maturity. So we get this age of generativity. And what does this mean? It's another feeling that the human being has. When you get to a certain age, or you develop to the cycle, then you will have to have this feeling that you can only get by helping others. You now have to go and help other people. And that's when you see people volunteer and they do all this stuff. You say, why do you spend all your time doing that for nothing? Well, I don't know. I, I just got to do it. Yeah, it's not right. Because you see, if you don't develop this sense of generativity, then you develop this sense of stagnation. You shut down. Where you just want to sleep and you don't want to move and you don't want to do anything. So you become very, very stagnant and you'll die that way. So there is a feeling that the human being needs to have by helping others. You just got to kind of do it. Then once you get past this feeling of generativity that it gives you of helping others, then you come to the stage of integrity. And this might happen 40 to whatever, 60. And integrity is that that's the final stage of human being of integrity. That's the stage of the elder. And with the elder, you can always tell elders, 
See, there are old people and there are elders, by the way, because you're old doesn't make you an elder. You can be a sick old person. A sick old person is somebody who has aged and never got these feelings, so they're angry. But I'm talking about that person who develops themselves through the cycle of life and they have this integrity. And you can tell them with integrity. Usually you will see, when you talk to them, one of the reasons they're so nice to be around is they see a, they see a worthwhileness to all things. And they, they can easily accept you just as you are. It's okay to be a banker. It's okay to be unemployed. It's okay to be black. It's okay to be young. It's okay. This is this, it's okay. See, when you're much younger, it's not okay. You better act like this in order for you to be okay. You better walk like this before you're okay. You better, you better, you better. You better be the right tribe before you're okay. Or you're white, oh, you're not okay. If you're Indian, oh, you're okay. If you're a breed, well, questionable. When they get a little bit older, they just see that whole cycle of life. They look at it differently. An elder you will see, when you get to the L stage of the elder, is by then they develop their own code by which they run their lives. They say, this is the way I will run my life. But they develop their own code by which they run their life. You see, when we're younger, if you ever notice, a lot of the times we don't do something, the real reason behind it is, is I might get caught. You ever notice? I better not do that. It's not because it would be right. It's because I might get caught. Therefore, I, I, better, I better not do it. But if I knew I wouldn't get caught, I'd probably give it a go. But elders are not like that. All of a sudden, they say, this isn't right for me. And they have convictions. And you can't bend their convictions. See, it's like the steps. When we're new in the steps often, our lives is run a certain way. And we try to say, well, could I make this exception to the step because I'm in a kind of this relationship and it's this kind of way? So I like to bend these principles to match my way of living. But the elders, they say, no, you need, to mat you need to bend your way of living to match these principle laws and values. They don't bend. And the elders will tell you that. They won't tell you what you want to hear always. Sometimes they will tell you what you need to hear. Usually that's why we go to them last. Because we all have friends. We have friends who will tell us what you want to hear. Say so you get in a fight with somebody. You know these three friends. You call them up and say, could we have lunch? I want to have an honest talk with you. So you're going to talk, talk, talk. You say, now be honest with me. I want you to tell me your true opinion. You already know they're going to agree with you. That's why you took them to lunch. But there's also certain ones you don't go to them because they're going to tell you, maybe you ought to look at yourself and you don't want to hear that. It's much easier to say, why can't I blame them? Because this time I really, really, really think it's their fault. So you see these elders then, they have this integrity. They see a worthwhileness. They have their own code of living and so this is the stages that the human being must develop to function functionally now this is what's so neat about the human if a tree gets wounded and it gets bent the tree will always grow with the bend because that's the nature of how a tree is designed the human is different because we are we have the ability to choose I can re-choose I can choose differently I can have something happen to me that was out of harmony, and I have the ability to come back and create a new picture to put me back in harmony, and this one takes the back seat, and then this new one takes the front seat. I can create a new me. I can go back, and even though I didn't get this feeling when I was young, right now I can get that feeling back. What do you think happens when you get a sense of trust? So you spend a number of years mistrust, now you get a sense of trust. Your relationships change. But see, Gandhi said, you must be the change you wish to see. It's about each person changing themselves. And to learn to help us to think different. But the steps helps us to learn what is it I should think. See, because the principle is that you move towards and become like that which you think about. Every human being is designed that way. You move towards and become like that which you think about. Now, if it's true that you move towards and become like that, what you think about, is it important to think about what you're thinking about? And that's what the steps is about, is to help us figure out what is that to think about. And these are some of the things we need to think about because this is how God made us to develop and to grow. And so we will cover um, in the next session the continuing uh, some more information that will really make the steps a power part of your life to make these changes so that we can see that the person that God intended us to become all along. Now is a good time to utilize the talking circle with your group. 
focus on a subject which was discussed on the tape. I believe much trouble and blood would be saved if we opened our hearts more. Charles Eastman, Sue.